ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Conversations with IFS, with me, your host, Jemima Nunu. Today, we have an exciting conversation with a gentleman who has over four decades of experience in corporate management. He's not a stranger to many of us. He has been um, both in the business world and also in the public sector in terms of management. He's a writer, presidential advisor. He's been and still is on numerous boards as a director. He is none other than Dr. Ishmael Yamsen. Thank you Dr. Ishmael Yamsen, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. And I'm so glad that you're here today Thank on you. Conversations with IFS. <clears throat> Firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on the launch of your book. Oh. I had the privilege of being a part of the launch yeah. of Africa in Search of Prosperity. Yeah. Um, before we start our conversation, can you tell us a little bit about the book? Well, um, and thank you very much for, for having me uh, on, on this program. Um, Africa in Search of Prosperity was inspired largely by several decades of Africa's attempt to move its people from poverty to prosperity. And try as Africa has, uh, today Africa is still in very dire straits. Uh, the main economies of Africa, South Africa, Angola, Nigeria, are all in great difficulty. Mm. And millions of Afri Africans are still um, in, in deep, deep poverty. And I, I, I couldn't understand why, after so much support from the international community, community after so much effort by African governments, Africa doesn't seem to be making any progress at all. I went back to my library and discovered that things that were discussed, things that I discussed 40, 45 years ago, are things that are being discussed today. And so I thought, let me put all these thoughts together and see whether I can generate a discussion as to what we have been doing wrong, why we are not getting it right, and what we should be doing uh, going forward. Because you see, the world is moving very fast. Africa seems to be going backwards. The gap is widening. And African country upon African, African country has a huge problem with youth unemployment. So if Africa doesn't act now, and we have no time, I think that we are sowing the seeds of great danger going forward. And that's what inspired me to put those thoughts together. OK. So you said if Africa doesn't act now, be in grave danger, how can we act? How should we act? We're, we're very good at, let's say, talking. Yes. But how do we move that talking and the rhetoric to action? Well, you are right. Africa and most African countries, the African leaders, suffer from diarrhea of words, diarrhea of ideas, but constipation of action. We talk, and we know how to talk. Africans, are, I mean, Ghanaians especially, um, we can talk a lot. But when it comes to executing our plans coming from plans into action and making sure that we, we do what we say we will do, we don't. And I think, first of all, Africa needs to understand that its own future is in its own hands. We should buy our own future. That is the way I want to put it. Africa must buy its own future. We cannot forever depend on aid and loans and grants and commodity prices to develop Africa. It isn't going to help. We need to take decisive action to change Africa. We should move Africa from commodity dependence into services, into value addition, into innovation, just like the Chinese have done. 
The Chinese have taken just about 20, 25 years to take 400 mi million people out of poverty. So it can be done. It can be done, but I believe that we need to have clarity on where we want to go. But let me also add one point. I think we have, been, we have not been lucky in Africa with our leadership. Leadership that is focused on efficiency, leadership that is visionary, leadership that is transparent, leadership with integrity. I call that kind of leadership authentic leadership. Leadership that is not there to look after itself. That's what we have. Yesterday somebody asked me, is democracy and corruption synonymous with each other? And I said no. We have had one party government in Ghana before. We've had one party state in Angola, one party state in many countries in Africa. They haven't made any difference. We can't blame democracy for it. We can blame our leaders and our institutions. And we should get our institutions right. We didn't need Obama to come here and tell us that build strong institutions. We have known this all along. That's why we created all these institutions. But we've created all these institutions, and all we do is to undermine the institutions so they are unable to do what they are able to do. So we need to create strong institutions. We need new kind of leaders in Africa. Leaders that are selfless. Lead and I want to see African leaders in democracies who can stand up and say, I don't care whether I'm voted out after one term or not. I just want to change my country, mm -hmm. and I want my people to be prosperous. Mm -hmm. That kind of leader will not even need to go out there and, and campaign. Mm -hmm. The people will see, they will feel it, and they will vote for that leader. But if you have leaders who, from day one, all they are doing is thinking about themselves and how much money they borrowed for the election and why, how they should replace the money and how many cars they should get and how many houses they should buy. I'm sorry, we are not going to get anywhere. And it's not only in Ghana. I visit many African countries, and everywhere you go, the story is the same, unfortunately. But Dr. Yamsen, you've been in the very privileged position of having the ear of many leaders. Um, so how have you tried to change that kind of mindset so that we have leaders that do have the vision, that do want to implement the right policies? You see, it will, it will surprise you that most leaders that I have interacted with, both in Ghana and outside Ghana, will tell you all the good things. They will tell you, they will tell you all the great things they want to do for their country. Sometimes you know they believe in what they are saying. Sometimes you know they don't believe in what they are saying. But I think they, they are aware of what they want to do. They know what they should do. I think the problem of African leaders is that they are not able to resist the pressures that come upon them. Uh, pressures from their parties, if they are democracies, pressures from their family, pr pressures from their friends, pressures from their colleagues. Um, the very people who will complain that things are not going well are the same people who are chasing after the leaders for favors. And I think what we need are leaders who have the strength of will. We call that self, self-confident integrity. People who can stand up and say, I'm sorry, I won't do it, no matter what. I know this is wrong, I won't do it. I know this is right, that's what I won't do. And that's why, you see, leaders must have conscience. African leaders must begin to develop nothing but conscience. If you have conscience, you know what you are doing is right. You know what you are doing is bad. So don't do what you know is bad. Just do what you know is right. So if we begin to develop that kind of leaders, then, then we will get somewhere. So the leaders who talk to me and that I interact with, and, and I was a presidential advisor for, for, for four years. And I can tell you that Professor Amir is one of the best leaders we ever had in this country. Very honest, great integrity, great drive. Many people didn't know that he had enormous strength and drive. But you couldn't say the same thing about everybody around him. 
and unfortunately, uh, he wasn't. He was not the best healthy person that we, as a president. So, I think that our leaders just have to understand that they 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 vied for power, not to serve themselves, mm -hmm. but to serve the people who brought them into power, and let the. Uh, they are, they are followers I understand. When, the, when President Kufado said some time ago that if you are with me because of money, then I'm sorry, you don't belong to my government. I believed it. And I want to see that, that indeed, if any of his people put their foot wrong, you'll be prepared to fire those people. And that's the only signal you can give. Mm -hmm. Whether in the private sector or in the in the in the in the in the public sector, unless a dealer, a leader, is decisive about what is right and what is wrong, that organization will make no progress whatsoever. Well, let's move on to the private sector, as you right. said, and you have many years of experience um, leading in the private sector. I want to ask, what were some of the major challenges that you found, let's say, when you were um, one of the heads of Unilever? Um, That's a very interesting question, yeah? <laughs> so let me split it into problems that were internal to Unilever, mm. or many of the companies I am associated with, and problems that are external to Unilever. If, if I take the internal dynamics, I probably would say one big challenge was the human capital. Unfortunately, in Ghana, our training institutions don't take account of the needs of industry. They, they have programs. They run the programs hoping that th those programs, programs are relevant to what industry wants. It's not always the same. So you, have, you, you sit at interviews, you will, you will interview very brilliant uh, young girls and, and boys who have, who have been very well educated. But, but who will need three, four, five years more of training before they become uh, really productive for you. So you couldn't go to the market unless you, you then started to say, look, I will, I will bring people from outside all the time, which is not the best thing to do. You need to grow people. So that was one major problem that we faced. The second major problem was the fact that the, and that, is, that has something to do also with the bureaucracy, but there are things that you need to do in, in, in your company with the support of the public sector. But because the public sector, and I'm not, I'm, I don't want to say they are hostile, but the public sector is simply sometimes inefficient, uninterested, ineffective. They make life in the public sector extremely difficult, in the private sector extremely difficult. Because you, you, you need, uh, uh, a permit, or you want to clear goods from the port, or, or you want uh, uh, some uh, clarity on some uh, uh, legislation, or you get a letter from GRA, we've done your tax assessment, this is how much you should pay. Of course, that's fine. But you look at the, all the laws and you say, but unfortunately, this, it's not relevant. Now, it's going to take a lot of time to convince. So time that you should use to sit, to think and plan and build your business, mm -hmm. you are using it, sorting problems out with the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy is a major obstacle to business growth in Ghana. Now, the, the, the other thing we probably we say in the, public, in the private sector is that we have a small market in Ghana. And therefore, if you want, and, and most public, uh, private sector companies uh, therefore make do with old technology, 
uh, things that uh, technology that probably have, have come and, and they have they, 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 they've not been scrapped in Europe or whatever is what you go for. because if you go and, and buy a modern technology with high speed you have a very small market you need say the ECOWAS market to 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 build um, uh, volumes that will allow you to grow faster, create more jobs, employ more people. But that is because, and therefore you, you have many public sector companies using old, antiquated, inefficient, very heavy on energy plant and equipment. Mm. Now, and they are very heavily taxed. So they can't even save money to re-equip with modern technology. So these are some of the, 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 the issues that actually uh, uh, private sector people face internally. But if I should then say, what are the issues you face outside? That is numerous. Electricity is one. If you get it, it's fine. If it is reliable, if the voltage is right. Mm -hmm. If the cost is right, mm. and that's only a small sector, the road to your factory may be totally impassable. If you go to Takradi and you go to the area where uh, the Gassem and other people are located there, I just saw in the paper yesterday that the new Takradi road is being done. It was terrible. But why should I pay as a private sector company so much taxes and duties? and the city authority will not do the road to mine. And you have small, young SMEs who probably have money to set up their business. They have to spend their own money to go and make their road to their factory, to go and buy the poles so they can connect electricity, to go and buy the pubs so they can get water. So where is the money for working capital? So for a private sector organization, Outside there are problems that simply make life difficult for operators in this country. And that's why, I mean, in, if you look at the cost of doing business in Ghana, Ghana has been going down year after year. I think, I understand now we are about 140 or so out of 190, around 14 out of 190. I mean, why should we? And yeah, you take countries like even Rwanda, a country that 20 years ago was subsumed in in, in war and, and, and massacre. Today, we send Ghanaian executives to go and see what Rwanda is doing. And we are all very happy. We, we are laughing about it. But we should not be ashamed. We've been independent since 1957. And we celebrate Independence Day every year. Poor school children go and stand in the sun, and the president comes to make long speeches. What, what are we celebrating? Poverty or what? And I think that African countries need to understand this. And the private sector, and I say to my colleagues in the private sector, sometimes it is better for you to begin to think that you want to succeed in spite of government. So plan your, your, your strategy and, and your plans and your action plans as if government doesn't exist. Because if you are waiting for government to do X, Y, is there for you to succeed, you'll be where you are forever. Because outside there is a very harsh environment. Very harsh environment. I mean, we introduced the, uh, the stabilization tax during, I think, Osama Mafo's time. It was introduced for three years to support the budget. It's become part of our revenue generation. After you have paid all your taxes and everything, before you even pay your dividend, the government says, give me money to keep in case I mismanage the economy, I will use it to balance my books. Why in the world do you want to hear this? But it's there. Recently, it was extended to 2019. So companies have to pay. So how do we expect private sector companies ever to save money to invest and create jobs? Because we are transferring the money from the private sector, where money can be used more efficiently, give it to government where the money will be wasted. So the government is not saving, the private sector is not saving, and yet we say we want to grow our economy. It's, it's 
It's absurd for me. Mm. On that note, we would like to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about more issues to do with private sector development. Stay tuned. Welcome back viewers and today on Conversations with IFS we have Dr. Ishmael Yamsen talking to us about the role of business and fiscal management. Dr. Yamsen, welcome back again, Thank let's continue. Much. Thank you very much. So you were talking about um, public institutions yes. and how they should try and help businesses smooth the process for businesses. You have had the privilege again of being the board chairman mm. of a public institution. I'm talking about GIPC, yeah. Ghana Investment Promotion uh, Council, yeah. um, a public institution designed to help attract Invest foreign yeah. Di direct investment into Ghana. So, and what were your experiences, first of all, as board chair, and then we'll break it down and have a bit more of a conversation about the role of public institutions in private investment. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I think um, my first experience at GRPC was that um, many Ghanaians felt that the GRPC was there just for attracting direct foreign investment. Uh, they didn't appreciate the fact that the centre was actually set up also to promote indigenous Ghanaian investments in Ghana. Uh, to the extent that many uh, medium-sized Ghanaian entrepreneurs didn't know that the benefits and incentives under the law were applicable to them. Most of them didn't know. So we decided that the, the centre will uh, enlarge its campaign, make sure that we, we make contact with as many Ghanaian companies as possible, uh, so they are aware that once they register with the GIPC, the same benefits and incentives and attractions are applicable to them as Ghanaian companies. Because it, it, it's, it's, I found it rather odd that we will uh, give incentives and benefits to a foreign company to come and locate here. While we are not extending the same incentive and benefits to a Ghanaian entrepreneur with the same capacity to probably create the same uh, 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 company in Ghana. So that was my first experience. My second experience was the, the whole debate about should we give incentives and benefits to foreign companies to come to Ghana uh, or uh, are we not uh, giving away so much to foreign companies or even to investors generally. Now it's interesting because I, 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 always used, I used to say to people um, Britain gives incentives to, to uh, companies to come and invest in Britain. America attracts investment. All the countries in Asia are our competitors in attracting investments. There's a whole lot of capital sitting out there looking for places to invest. So why would we not first find out what do, we, what do these people need to come and invest in Ghana? And why and how can we make those things available to them to come and invest in Ghana? So, we, we, our CEO uh, and, and a team of, uh, of the directors uh, did a number of uh, tours in Asia, in Singapore, uh, in Europe. Um, and I thought that it, it, it and, and the team at that time, I must say, was very aggressive. Quite a number of companies actually ended up entering the Ghanaian market. And then for the first time, we also had the Ghanaian companies coming to the center and registering with the center and enjoying the same facilities as foreign companies to enjoy. But let me say that I think as a country, we don't have clarity about what exactly do we need and where do we need 
investors from outside. How do we want to attract those investors? And how do we want them to remain in Ghana? Every now and then you will hear, and even only recently, I think two, three days ago, I saw in one of the publications uh, a huge complaint about all the incentives and benefits that were given to GE to come to Ghana to do deep water uh, uh, exploration of oil. And uh, deep water exploration is not a joke. Not many oil companies in the world have got the technology to do it. To get the GE, first to think about coming to Ghana. Because when we talk about the big boys, we are talking about GE and the others. To come to Ghana, invest. You will need to bend backwards. Because I remember uh, during the period when Margaret Thatcher was destroying the coal industry in Ghana in the, in the Midlands, there were several you know, you know, areas where the coal mining companies collapsed. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher paid 80 million pounds to a Japanese company, a car manufacturing company, to come and build a factory so that the people there who had lost jobs in the coal mining company can have, find jobs in it. So we have to just be strategic about what we want to do. Where do we want to attract foreign direct investments? What are we prepared to give them? And, and then do a cost benefit analysis and say, look, if we give away so much, let's say 10 years tax holiday, it will cost Ghana so much. If that company succeeds in 10 years, what will we get back? And then try and negotiate and say, OK, uh, what is the payback period? Because I have a private sector, but when I put my money in the company, I want the payback period. So it's not different. When we give incentives and benefits, we are investing in that company. So what is our payback period? What, how long is it going to take that company to start paying taxes, to start paying duties, to start pay, employing many more people, to start giving us more foreign exchange, and then compare and see, OK, if we give you so much, it will take us 15 years to get our money back. No, we don't want. We want 10 years. We want our money back in 10 years. And that is the, be the benchmark for negotiating. We should not sit outside and, and complain. Because when we do that, the world of investment is a small world. Everybody says, Ghana, if you go there, they'll give you the incentives. Two years later, someone is coming to come and withdraw the incentives from you. Don't go there. We need to understand. And we need to buy into it as a, as a nation. It is not something for Ishmael Yamsun or for GRPC, for NPP or NDC or PPP or how many parties do we have? Many of them. We won't. Yesterday, I listened to uh, Siramaposa speaking in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I thought he was talking about Ghana. Every issue he raised is relevant to Ghana. Unemployment of the youth, people without housing, corruption in the SOEs. I sat down there and I said, my God, God, please bless Africa with new leaders because all these problems are everywhere. You see? SOEs are very key. We have many of them, and they are in strategic sectors. They give us power. They give us water. Eh? Uh, most of the universities are public sector universities. Uh, they build the roads. They build the ports. They manage it. So the private sector is actually handy. With all these inefficient private sector, uh, public sector around the public mm. private sector. So what I'm saying is that for everybody who is put in charge of a public institution, you must first know that you are there to serve the interest of Ghana. It can be Ghana Water, uh, Forestry Commission, Cocoa Marketing Board, whatever, whatever. You are not there for yourself. You are there for Ghana. And we must all have a singular vision which says, we want to create a country, as Graham Kruber said, where every Ghanaian will not wake up, or no Ghanaian will wake up in the morning and think about what he will eat, where he will sleep, what the work he will do. When are we going to get there? When all these state, state organizations and institutions don't think about that. If you go to our courts, I don't have to tell you, 
about uh, the, all the things that our friend journalist did with the judges and everything, mm -hmm. right? You have a case as a private sector operator company in six years, seven years, the case is still pending. So they, we need to get private sector institutions right. And I, I must say that I didn't have problem when I was in GRPC with interference from politicians because maybe the judge wouldn't want to come and talk to me because they know who I am. <laughs> but if you are made a chairman or a CEO or a director of a state institution, don't give, start giving excuses that political, because of political interference, I can't do this, I can't do that. They don't accept the job. Don't accept it. Don't accept it and start giving excuses. Because that is unacceptable. Look at all the corruption cases that are out. They are all from SOEs. They are all in debt. They are all badly managed. Now, if these are very key to our progress, and they are badly managed, and they are in debt, and they are corrupt, when are we going to make progress in Ghana? We have to clean that up. So when, when Sri Ramaphosa said that one of his key, key actions to clean up the SOEs, he had a standing ovation. We haven't got a situation to stand up and clap that we have a leader who's going to clean up the SOEs. But we need to get it right. Dr. Yamsen, how do we clean up the SOEs? How do we make sure that these SOEs are as efficient as their wholly private sector counterparts? You see, for instance, look, when I was chairman of Unilever, my boss was sitting in London. But my boss was not interfering with what I'm doing in Ghana. All right? I'm chairman of Stanchat. Nobody. I have a, a framework within which the bank should work in Ghana, straightforward, there's no interference. Nobody is going to tell me, look, uh, this contract that you are going to give, I am interested in it, so make sure that uh, when these, the bids come, give me the list of the people who are putting the bids, and I'll tell you who should get it. We, the question you asked me, we need a leader who is ruthlessly against corruption. And I mean, ruthlessly against corruption, meaning he is simply intolerable to anything corrupt. And that if any of his appointees is corrupt, he is prepared to fire that person. That's the only answer. Because, unfortunately for us, our constitution gives the president the right to appoint all these CEOs, all these chairmen, all these board members. Very powerful. All right? So only he can deal with them. Because he appointed them. He's the appointed officer. I was thinking more along the lines of systems in place. You talk about how um, in your chairship you're able to resist, you're able to implement exactly what you do. But you are Ishmael Yamsen. Yes. You are you. Yes. But what systems or processes can we put in place so even if it's not an Ishmael Yamsen I agree. that is a leader I that's agree. still things at will least move on. let me tell you one thing. One of the biggest areas of corruption is procurement. All right, in Ghana. We have a procurement law, an act passed by parliament, which clearly defines how everybody should behave when it comes to procurement in the public sector. So why do we still have problems with procurement in the public sector? Everybody puts the law aside and do what they like. That is an act. It's not even a simple process and system that is in the company. This is an act with penalties under the law. Financial Services Act, eh? mm. by the Auditor General. Every board member is supposed to have a copy. Every CEO has a copy. Every Executive in any company must have a copy. It's a law. It tells you what you can do, what you cannot do. So we have the processes and we have the systems. We have the framework. People just abuse those systems and processes and the acts that we ourselves as a people have put together to guide our behavior. But nothing happens to them. That actually is the question. 
Why is it that when people abuse our laws, nothing happens to them? If I have been there and I've stolen money and I don't go to jail and you come, why wouldn't you also steal money? Because after what is going to happen to you? Nothing. Nothing was going to happen to you. But if people know that, why do, why do ministers in the British Parliament resign for simple infractions? They resign for their reputation. All right? Mm -hmm. How many ministers in Ghana have you seen get up and say, I disagree with my party and I am out of this place? Has it ever happened in Ghana? I don't know. Maybe I'm too old to remember that somebody did that. But we have to get to a stage where our people who have integrity to stand up and say, this is wrong. It doesn't matter from what quarters it's coming from. That if it is, it's a, it's, I mean, well, there was a huge debate about the technology that Smith, uh, I, I don't know where the case is now, but Yoko and whatever were all supposed to be investigating. Very simple. I'm sure they have the processes in Smith. I'm sure they have the systems there. I'm sure the Public Procurement Act applies to Smith. So my question is, why don't we then say, yes, OK, we are all humans. We are fallible. But if so, therefore, somebody will, willfully commits that crime, this is the penalty. But when people start protecting their, their, their colleagues simply because they, have, they are in the same party or they, are, they were uh, in school together or they belong to the say the one society after another, that is where our society will break down. Because those who are to protect us are those who are raping our country of its resources. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that if you go to all these institutions, you'll be amazed. They have all the processes and the systems there. People just find ways and means of abusing those systems and processes simply because they know they can get away with crime. And that is the bottom line. And we should get to a stage where we, all of us, should say, enough is enough. This can go on forever. And that's why I'm happy that at long last, we have the special prosecutor. I'm not talking about the individual, mm. but the institution. The office of. But I hope it doesn't go the same way as all the others, because we have institutions already that were supposed to deal with the same criminal acts. They haven't been effective. So why do we think that this one will be effective? Yes, the individual is good. I know him personally. He is good. But he, he needs, he will need the resources and the infrastructure to make his work well. He's going to work with investigators. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. who, who says the investigators are like him or will be like him? And I am very passionate about this country. I, I can tell. I, I want Ghana. I want to be proud to step outside of this country. And people should respect me because I'm a Ghanaian. I don't want people to say, oh, but we heard in your country. It, it makes me sick. See? Yeah. And, and, and I think that, look, we have the intelligentsia. We have well-educated people. They, I mean, you meet them outside of this country, and you are proud to be a Ghanaian. And yet, here, at home, look at the mess. On that note, I think we'll t it's time for us to go for a break. And when we come back, we'll discuss more about fiscal management and Ghana Beyond Aid. Stay tuned. Dr. Yamsen, 
Um, you, last section, you were very passionate about Ghana and where you saw Ghana going. And recently, you've been um, talking about the latest hot topic on Ghana Beyond Aid. Um, and I would like to quote to you. Um, you stated that governments have borrowed and over-borrowed and governments have come under severe fiscal stress because they're not only paying debts, but they're also paying the interest in that debt. How do we overcome this vicious cycle? How? First of all, let me take you back to um, the 2005, there about when, no, 2000, when President Kufuor mm. took over power and took Ghana into HIPIC. Mm. And I remember at uh, uh, Agri Prism, Judges Beck Memorial Lecture mm. in Legon, um, Wolfenson, who was then the, the World Bank uh, president, say, the world took a checkbook and paid off Ghana's debt. So at that time, we had zero debt. So why is it that when all our debt were forgiven, the debt were forgiven as if God forgave all our debts. Eh? Mm -hmm. But we have managed, in fact, that by the end of 2016, our debt service was unsustainable, 73%. Remember, it, only in 2000, 2004, we, we had no debt. Between that time and today, we have borrowed so much that we no longer, we have, we have gone beyond what is seen as unsustainable debt uh, management. And it's just like a, a child with one CD going to a, a mall. And with one CD, he wants to buy everything. He wants ice cream, he wants toffee, he wants puff fruit, he wants this, with one CD. That's how we behave as Ghana. We don't have the money, yet we want everything. We are not disciplined enough to say, this is what we can do within this time frame, and therefore, we will stay within that budget. Of course, every country borrows, but every country borrows sensibly. So if you, you borrow maybe 30% of your GDP or 35% is it's understandable. But the reason why we are there because we don't save. We don't save as a country. And I just explained to you why the private sector is not saving and the government is not saving. And therefore, the only recourse if we have to fund our budget is to go out there. Either ask for aid, ask for grants, which come with all the conditionalities, or go out there and borrow money. And now with cheap money in Europe and America, everybody, everybody was free to lend to the, to the developing world. And therefore, we went there freely. Nobody forced us. We went there. Today, we issued this bond. Tomorrow, we issued that bond. And we are happy when the bond is oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. Why? Why should it be oversubscribed? When they get 1% in, in America, and you are giving them 90% or 30% or 50%. Why would they come and put their money? Every six months, you are paying them interest. So we need to sit back and be rational and be disciplined. And, and therefore, that's my, I have a little worry today. We have many initiatives, many. The free SHS is a fantastic idea, but it is expensive and it will cost money. And I, will, I would have wished that we saw that through and make sure that it was perfectly well executed. But on the back of it, we had one district, one this, one this, one recently I had one district, one warehouse, everybody, and many, many, many other initiatives. We create uh, uh, more regions, which means more districts. Already, public sector wage bill 
is a huge burden on government. Huge. So the first thing that we should do, and I say this all the time, let us focus the agenda. How many things can we practically do in the next four years, in the next eight years, in the next 10 years? Ghanaians are very reasonable people. And all you need to do is to demonstrate that those few things that you have focused on, you do them and you do them well. You cannot construct all the roads in Ghana in one year, not even in two years, not even in three years, not even in four years. But you can start from somewhere and let the people know that, yes, we can see progress. They will be prepared to wait. But then go and tell them, in a campaign, all the parties were promising to do everything, solve all of Ghana's problems, all in four years. So you come to power, and because it was a, a campaign promise, you must execute. I said, no. Go and talk to Tony Blair. Tony Blair will tell you what I said on the campaign floor is different from what I'm supposed to do, because now I know how much money I have in my pocket. And maybe one week, two weeks, people will talk about it, but that's the reality. So if people go, to, everybody goes to senior high school, and the teachers are there, the infrastructure is there, the books are there, the ICT, ICT facilities are there, and we are churning out uh, SHS students, the type that we really want to see, who will not give you credit for it? But if you are diverting the little money you have on everything, what do you end up now to say, okay, I did the budget, this is the gap, I have to go and borrow money to come and fill the gap. And not only to fill the gap, but also pay the interest on the existing loan. And yesterday I, I said that, look, the Minister of Finance is doing fantastic work in reprofiling the debt, borrowing long term to pay off the short end debt. But of course, it's still the debt. Don't forget that you will still have to pay someday. You have only extended the duration of paying that debt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. What we should be doing now is how much of our debt can we pay off? through from our own revenues that we are generating, which means we should grow our economy, we should grow the sectors that will help us generate the money, the manufacturing, the, uh, the services, the, uh, the, the agriculture, we should be aggressive. Look, Luxembourg is a small country. They don't have anything, but it's a very rich country. They only, they only decided that we will become the logistics hub for the rest of Europe. So all these Chinese people who want to travel Europe, they will store their goods and services here. in Luxembourg. And then from Luxembourg, they will distribute to the rest of it. One item that they have chosen, and Luxembourg is a the, the Dutch people, the same thing that they did. We want to be a, a service center a logistics center for the rest of Europe. In Ghana, we won't do everything. We, 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 we are blessed. We have cocoa, we have gold, we have uh, oil, we have this. The oil is not being a, a case anyway. Now we are going to add uh, bauxite, integrated bauxite. It's good. But those are commodities. If you look at Ghana's growth pattern, years of high growth rates coincide with years of high commodity prices. Years of, and in between 66 and 81, years of low commodity prices were years we were in trouble and the years we had good task. Okay? So we need to think, and I want to hear where we move, how we move our country from a factor-driven country to a service-driven country. Agriculture is important, but we should be talking about value addition and not export cocoa. Since we have been exporting cocoa beans? And then the only thing we have done is to export cocoa fat, which is itself a commodity. We did nothing. Go to Malaysia, what they've done with palm oil. Mm -hmm. hmm? They 
out of palm oil, they, 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 they build upholstery, they build personal products, they build oils. It's amazing the industry behind one crop palm oil. The only thing we have done in Ghana with our crop called cocoa is fat, produce cocoa fat and export. So when I talked about debt, I am saying let's have a clear plan out of debt. Let us have a very clear plan to say in the next eight, ten years we will not owe. If we will owe, we will owe at the lower end 30% of GDP, that's fine but not 68%. And congratulate ourselves. And look at the, the, the debt, the interest payment alone on the debt. It can do a lot for us. It's just like I mean, any individual who, is, you know, who thinks that he can go around spending all his money and borrowing money and every time, every month, he has to take new loan to go and pay the, 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 the previous month's loan. You know, in, when we were young, we, 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 we knew we were, we were told of uh, Sambam. I don't know whether you understand. You go, you take the charcoal, and you, know, you cross the wall. So the loan, you took the last band. When you come and pay, they cross it. Then they draw another one because you've come to take another loan. <laughs> you see? And that's, that's how we are behaving. But it's unsustainable. Remember, our population is growing. Every time I drive on the streets, and I see these numerous young men and women hustling around. And their numbers are being added to every year. I understand the public universities graduate about 75,000 students mm -hmm. graduates every year. Add the other 30 something private universities. So roughly 150,000 graduates come out of the university every year. Who, who has a plan to say, in the next 10 years, we will create an economy that can absorb at least 70% or 60% or even 50% of these graduates. If that is not our strategic agenda is, I'm saying we are going nowhere. We need a clear, a clear plan to success out of debt. Thank you. On that note, Dr. Yamsen, um, we want to thank you for your very spirited, very <laughs> animated um, conversation with us. Um, indeed, for me, it's really refreshing to see a man of your age and stature with so much passion for Ghana still. Um, as I've told you previously, I think deep down you're um, the ever optimist so thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your experiences and your thoughts. Thank you very much. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning. I hope you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you and being with you again the same time next week. Stay tuned.